and welcome to the last episode of season two of the BPD Bunch. I'm your host, Zanny, and today I'm here with Alex, Lena, Melanie, and Celine. Where in the world is everyone coming from? New Jersey in the USA. I'm calling from London in the UK. I'm coming from Minas Gerais, Brazil. Toronto in Canada. I'm coming from New Mexico, also in the USA. So today we are going to be talking about dysfunctional patterns in romantic relationships. There's a number of different theories about how BPD is developed and all of these theories really involve a relationship. And when we think about the biosocial theory, it talks about feeling invalidated when interacting with your caregivers. But we can also use that same theory, and it's been extended to current adult relationships and how BPD is actually maintained within those relationships because of these patterns that continue, even as an adult in relationships. And this happens a lot in romantic relationships because you're very close with that person. This distress within this close relationship is really what's maintaining those symptoms of BPD. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this is why people will often say like, oh, my BPD was fine until I got into a romantic relationship. And that was true for mm -hmm. me is I would be in a great place and then I'd get into a relationship and it was like all my symptoms came out. Romantic relationships were the ones that really the only thing that's ever activated dangerous suicidality or self-harm. I actually can't think of a time when I was seriously trying to harm myself or it was not related to a romantic relationship. It's the same for me, except for my first one was to do with my dad. So I kind of capture it in sort of men. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that if we think about the symptoms of BPD, so if you think about the unstable identity, a lot of times we have a difficulty defining ourselves outside of our relationships and our romantic relationships are often our most important relationships. So we really start to, to define ourselves based on this relationship. And so a lot of times when that relationship breaks down or there's a fight, it's like so much more as it feels like it's on the line, you know, like kind of like, it's like your whole sense of self or your stability is on the line, which I guess could bring me also to talk about attachment styles too most people with BPD have something that's called a fearful or disorganized attachment style, which means that they really are fearing the loss of the relationship. And then oftentimes it kind of like flip flops with more of an avoidance style too. So it's kind of like a push and pull. It's like we want to get really close and then we get really afraid, you know, maybe that someone's going to leave us and then we pull away. Um, and it's that's why it's called disorganized because you, there's no like one strategy that a lot of us use in our relationships in relating to other people and our attachments to other people. Um, but it's interesting because most of the research in the past has looked more like generally at someone's attachment style, but more recent research is kind of showing that that's people don't have like a one type of attachment style. Usually you have like a pretty general kind, but it might be different in different relationships. Like people with BPD can have secure attachment relationships. They can have positive, healthy relationships. There might just be certain types of relationships that activate that fear of abandonment a little bit more. Um, and that's usually the romantic relationship. So there's a lot of anxiety there, a lot of like, please don't leave me. And at the same time, I'm so afraid of getting so close to you because I might completely lose myself in you. All the relationships before Steve, my husband, it was, yeah, it was traumatizing. It was, please don't leave me. Yeah. I'm gripping for you. You know, the love avoidant going into every relationship, knowing that half of these men didn't want to be with me. I get asked this question a lot. Well, do I need to be completely healed in my love uh, of just, not just myself in love in general and the way I look at relationships to start dating. Not at all, because we're constantly a work in progress. It's not perfect. Working through relationship issues without being in the relationship, it's very difficult to do that. And my therapist encourages me 
you know, it's okay to date and to try it out and to learn as you go with your partner because you can't you can't be healed on your own and then go into a relationship because that other person has their own issues and together you, you work through that as long as it doesn't then become codependent, which we can get into um, in a bit. A lot of people with BPD and research like support, generally supports this is that we choose partners that we walk into relationships with people that it's they're not going to give us as much as we give yeah. them. We walk into relationships that it's not going to be a fair partnership. The Maybe the more important thing about healing in relationships is being able to notice when you're entering a relationship with someone, it's not, it's not going to be a healthy relationship. And looking for the signs that someone is going to be able to have a secure healing relationship with you. Yeah. Well, the whole like biosocial theory of BPD is that BPD is developed and maintained in relationships, right? So, you know, in the same sense, like attachment, secure attachment is developed and maintained in relationship. And so, you know, it's, and we also use the term transactions when we talk about bi the biosocial theory, because it's not, oh, your childhood did this to you and now you're this way. Right. The transaction is, you know, your caregiver or your loved one or whoever acts a certain way, you react, they react, it's like that back and forth, right? So it's not necessarily something that is static, it's very dynamic and changeable and workable. And you can look for certain signs of secure attachment from someone in the beginning. And because of your previous experience and, you know, sort of developmental trauma, you're going to walk into the, the relationship not having a lot of skills and you're not having a lot of skills is going to, you know, activate your partner's own stuff, right? And so this is why, you know, we're talking about how like healing happens in relationship because that's going to happen no matter what relationship you get in. You know, like I'm very fortunate to be my partner is, you know, he has his stuff too, but it's generally a very securely attached person. However, like once we started, like our relationship stuff came up and it's like working through that, that developed mm -hmm. the healthy relationship. Beautifully put. Yeah, I'm really glad that you, that we're talking about this in, in much more of a dynamic way because everyone early on in my treatment journey was trying to look at like some event or something that my parents did to me that was a problem. And that actually caused that ended up being a big part of why I couldn't understand why I was having a problem because there wasn't any of this stuff. I had a great relationship with my parents and then it was, I started trying to have romantic relationships and all of a sudden things were falling apart and I couldn't figure out why. And everything that, you know, the professionals were saying at the time was, well, there must be something, you just don't remember it. You know, it was like, but there isn't anything. And when my romantic relationships were falling apart, it was, it was really hard not to judge myself extra harshly. Like I had great examples. Why is this so hard? Why am I messed so messed up? Why does this keep falling apart? And, and it was really, it was really agonizing. So in Codependent No More, like this book and Melody Beattie, she's an author and she's cited in all the 12 step programs for CODA. A lot of the time they talk about the common denominators, like you're saying, that you come from a family system structure and normally your family exhibits these things. So why am I not exhibiting this? But there's also a slew of other reasons. Why? From self-esteem issues. And there's lots and lots of characteristics here, right? Not putting your needs first and you're constantly putting other people first, you know, and it's not having anything to do with our family. Sometimes it has nothing to do with a lot of things. So, and sometimes we don't know why, right? And, even in my own romantic uh, journey with my husband currently, I was reading things and being told things and to follow the steps and to do these things. And I found myself in times being like, it's not working, like F off to this person F. And, but what, what, what did work was doing everything I possibly could to figure it out with him and communicating with him and finding a way that worked with him and him not giving up and me not giving up. It doesn't have to always look the way it's supposed to look. I want to highlight the bio part of the biosocial thing too. This is actually something I was thinking of the other day. I mean, it's also important to remember that a lot of us are born with a vulnerability with like more emotional intensity, with more emotional sensitivity um, and things in our life impact us in ways that they might not for other people. So like a small interaction or, you know, a series of, difficult interactions while you're young, whether it's with your parents or peers, whoever, it might impact your life a lot more than it might someone else. Um, 
and the way that you relate to the world. And at the same time too, it's, it, sometimes it doesn't even really necessarily matter where it came from. It's like, this is just how we are now. And it's the, the purpose of working on it is to change the way we are now. It, we don't need to know. And sometimes it's very, it's very frustrating to be like, how did I get like this? It doesn't make sense. But sometimes it's like, that's just going to cause you more pain. <laughs> Yeah. And I think the the big thing is, is like, you can work on it. You know, like I before I met my partner, I have a very limited relationship history. I've never really been in a secure long term relationship. And I'm in my 30s. Right. And so I started to feel like it's just not going to happen for me. I better start getting used to being alone because I think I'm going to die alone. And I was convinced. Right. You know, because when I was deep in my BPD, I met all nine symptoms. I could not I just romantic relationships just did not work for me. Um, and like, it, because it's, it's both like the, it's the, the both sides of the fact that this is a, a biosocial thing, right? Is that the social part, because it's a transactional thing, because of how we show up in relationships and the other person reacts to that and vice versa, that both maintains our difficulty in romantic relationships. And when you get into a relationship where you're able to work on making those transactions healthier, more effective, that also changes your ability to show up in relationships, right? So like when you get into a relationship that is able to use like healthy skills and communication and stuff, like, you know, it's a process, you got to work on it. And like, eventually that also kind of changes how you see yourself and how you relate to other people and stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's not a, it's not a, a, uh, again, we talk about this a lot on the show that having BPD and all stuff, it's not a death sentence. It doesn't mean, oh, this is just how you're going to be for the rest of your life. Like it's a, it's a relational disorder. So in relationship, you're able to change how you show up and how you feel. Because I was such a codependent, I could definitely say that I put everyone before me. The one thing that I also did in most of my relationships, not just romantic, is I was the center of, I was the center, right? So it was always about me. But for me to be in this romantic relationship with Steve, it has to work for both of us. And checking in with him, how much somebody can take, how much someone has already taken, BPD, sometimes can be overwhelming for both parties. My partner's needs are just as important as mine. Yeah. And I'd say about balance too. The thing about balance is it's not 50-50 100% of the time. There are going to be times where, you know, like for example, I just moved to a different country to be with my partner. So I'm needing a lot more support, you know, even just finding where stores are, where do you buy this or whatever, right? So like our relationship is slightly imbalanced and like, you know, it will flow back and forth. That's kind of more what balance is. It doesn't mean a rigid sense of it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Something I'm trying to strive for, and I'm single now, but um, having come through a, a quite a heavy period of sex and love addicts, anonymous, codependence, anonymous, 12 steps and things like that, is I'm looking for a more equal rather than, I don't like to use the word balance exactly because of what you said, um, that it's it's not always like equally balanced 50 50 but a more equal partnership as well as you know having it out at external friends external interests external support systems um and having that security in each other as well as both bringing both having equal needs and bringing different things to the table whereas i would say probably the most important relationship of my life was my last one who with a with a man who also had BPD and we became we it became very clear that we were both codependent sex and love addicts but he was a compliant codependent and I was a controlling codependent and I was so um in denial about being a codependent because I was like I'm independent I'm not codependent but that's not, it doesn't mean that and when I looked at the 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 characteristics and things like that and really got into it they it was all interlinked and what I realized was I wasn't picking equal partners I was picking people to rescue or I was picking people to rescue me and that was it <laughs> that was the type I was going for and so I'm trying to be really intentional in the way I pick romantic partners which is I think what we were saying earlier that yes you can heal in relationships but also who who are you picking to heal with I struggle with the term codependent because I think some of these things are sort of like they're socially appropriate, right? And this is the piece of like, if you, you know, put 
what you're doing as a behavior in the context of the social environment you're part of, a lot of it makes sense. Like difficulty expressing anger. Most of us are told not to express anger, right? Especially as women, right? You know, don't be angry, then you're just an angry woman, right? The dictionary definition of codependent is not how we might define it in Codependence Anonymous. Um, and it's hard if to capture all the different characteristics of a codependent as in a code codependent anonymous 12-step program and just codependent as a, as a meaning and I've only just I would say in the past year or so started identifying as a codependent it stemmed from what I thought were BPD behaviors and I think probably the overlap is there but what I thought was promiscuity from my borderline was actually me you could sort of see it as getting a hit from getting validation and I also identify as a validation addict um, whether or not that's useful, different people have different views on that. But for me, it, it's more than just my borderline validation. That's how I get validation is, you know, I need it from other people because of my how I grew up in this dysfunction. I don't need it from other people. I need it from men. And there's a specific reason why I need it from men. And just breaking down the different um, characteristics of the different areas of that whole part of me has really helped treat different things in different ways with different types of treatment. As humans, we all have a need for human connection. Honestly, I think that people with BPD, just as we are often born with more sensitivity, I think we might also be born with just more of a need for connection. If you think about it in terms of the symptoms, you know, maybe we need more of a connection to understand ourselves. Maybe we need more of a connection to feel regulated based on what happened. I don't know what, I don't know what's the chicken or the egg. I don't know if, you know, our attachment patterns developed first and then we wanted more connection or the vice versa, but we're all born the same babies. You know, we're all born. We all need that connection, that comfort, that care. But when does it become something that we rely on? Like, is that something that we're born with? Are we born with more of a need for that? Or is it something that through our experiences and through the way that we have come to see other people, the world, ourselves, we need more of that? Like we need more validation, more care, more closeness. So it's so funny you bring this up because I had a conversation with my therapist about this exact thing uh, about a month ago because I was very frustrated by the fact that I don't do very well when I am by myself. Meaning, like, I tend to dissociate more easily, I get disconnected from my emotions, I have a hard time knowing what's real when I'm, when I'm literally alone. And it's not that I always have to be talking to someone, but even just being in the same space as another person helps me to feel like a human being. One of the things that she was saying is that, you know, a lot of it comes down to different needs and values. I guess the, th the answer that I interpret from what she said in in terms of what you're saying, Alex, is that it's a com probably a combination, right, of of how we are born with a greater need for connection from others. And then some of the things that we learn and the values that we grow to have as we get older, you know, I really value family. I really value my relationships. And I'm also very sensitive and have a higher need for connection from others. So it makes sense that I have a harder time being able to do things as effectively when I'm by myself for too long. Um, and accepting that that does not, that's not dysfunctional, that that that's, doesn't make me somehow less than other yeah. people who are naturally more inclined to be independent than me. Right. I realized I needed different actions to get the results I wanted because I wasn't getting the results I wanted because I was taking the same actions um that weren't leading me to the results so it wasn't that I need more love or more validation or more time with people or more connection it was what I was doing around those things were ineffective and actually causing me a lot of shame um and it causing ineffective results to give you an example I'm a people pleaser but instead of being over compliant where I become a doormat uh, for other people I'm actually too far probably the other way and that I don't let people be themselves because I think my way is the best way so in my last relationship who is someone who was younger than me and earlier in their BPD recovery I was very much 
I know more than you, I'm older than you, I'm more recovered than you, and therefore this is the way you should be doing it. When actually I've now learned, as we've been talking, everyone has an individualistic route to treatment. So I have had to come to terms with the fact that I am not God and that I am my way is a good way. It's worked for me, but it's not for everyone. And so it's not that I had a problem communicating. It's actually what I was communicating was was an issue and I needed to work on my own thoughts about that, which I have now done. And hopefully I'm getting there. I think you bring up a huge point, which is like, um, it, what what sort of relationships we need, what they look like is going to be different for everybody, right? So much of that is social context, cultural context, our own values, all that, right? But it's what's effective for us and how do we do that? And a lot of us, like, you know, because of the that transaction in our childhood, we don't have the skills to get what we need in relationships, right? It's like yeah. something I always, you know, tell to my clients, you know, because in DBT, we talk a lot about like self-judgment, like, you know, we're not here for self-judgment. What specifically are you talking about, right? Like, and a lot of judgment, uh, personal self-judgment that a lot of people with BPD can have is, oh, I'm really manipulative. And it's like, okay, what do you mean by that? Because often when we're talking about being manipulative, what we mean is that I don't actually have the skills to ask for what I want. So I do that controlling thing, right? And so it's about learning those skills. I think that's the, the important part. That's such a beautiful point. Wow. Because I think a lot of the time, even like we were touching on, am I ready to be in this relationship? It's, am, it's again, it's the, am I, it's, do I have those skills? Am I enough? And it's always, it's I, am I capable? And I really learning that I don't have to have it all together to be okay. And how many times that you said, we do need validation. It's the idea of what does that look like? And the, the thing is having my partner sometimes look at me and say, it's okay, you're on the couch right now. I love you. And you know, that moment when he looks at me and he says, I love you and me actually believing him for the first effing time in my life, like ever, because to believe somebody when you have BPD, man, I can tell you anybody listening right now, Half the times you really believe people when they say, I love you, or you're beautiful, or I get you, I support you. That moment when you can believe somebody, that means that you're healing, you know? So those are the moments, like you're saying, that am I enough? Do I have the skills? I'm not actually manipulative, so why is my brain telling me that? So it's a very good point, because a lot of the time it had to do everything with my self-worth and everything to do with me and nothing to do with anything else. There's a lot of social psychology principles that talk about we're more willing to accept things from other people, like people's views of us that we believe in ourselves. So when someone's saying they love you and you hate yourself, it might make you feel uncomfortable. It might make you feel like that's just not true. And it can be really difficult in relationships. And I understand that for a lot of our partners in relationships, it's like, why does this person not feel that they that I really love them. Why don't they trust me? Like a lot of people with BPD have serious trust issues. I think a lot of times they come from very valid places, but it's learning to trust that person. It happens through these secure relational patterns where you can start to develop this trust and start to to see their words as meaning something. Or, you know, I noticed in a more recent dating experience of mine that this person wasn't very vocally uh, affectionate, which was hard for me at first because in the past, that was something that was so important to me, but I felt secure. I felt like I trusted how I knew he felt about me. And it's not always just about wanting to hear those words. And going back to what we were saying before about validation is, yep, it's totally also valid to want validation. And at the same time, we have to learn how to be okay if we don't get that validation. How can we validate ourselves if we're not getting that from others? That's definitely something I've had to really work hard and learn to be compassionate to myself and be nice to myself and self-soothe when I may want to self-harm and self-validate. And that for me, self-validation looks like self-soothing and self-care. Um, And that took a really, really long time because I'd always relied on my romantic relationships to do that for me. And if I wasn't in one, then I was worthless. And when I was in one, 
and I was only worth as much validation as I could get from my romantic partner. And now I'm, you know, in my 30s and single and trying to heal how to be nice to my little girl. And if I struggle with compassion to myself, think about myself at seven or three in that way. And that reframing it in that way has really helped me be kinder, even when I don't feel like it, because the end result is always so much better in that kind of self-validation journey has taken me a very long time as someone with BPD but my god is it been worth it yeah yeah I remember the first time my therapist brought up like she's like how do you validate yourself I was like what are you talking about like (laughs) that you know that's what other people are for right so this huge (laughs) point of like you know I definitely relate to like having sought only that in relationships and like learning how to give it to yourself is such a powerful tool I was going to just say, if you don't validate yourself, you're never going to be able to trust your emotions too. You know, it's Mm -hmm. always going to be like, is this okay what I'm feeling right now? And it's like, it's okay if you feel like it's okay. No, you don't need the Mm -hmm. other person to tell you that. So this seems like a a good sort of transition into some of the like specific things that we have done or do to overcome or deal with sort of relationship dysfunction patterns. Um, earlier in the episode, we were talking about, you know, not needing to be healed before you're in a relationship. Um, and I think that's true. And one of the things that I, that Alex brought up was this idea that we often enter into relationships with people who maybe are not the best fit for us. So one of the things that I thought was really important for me that I did before I got into a relationship with my husband was I had had a history of falling in love with the idea of someone and trying to force them to fit that idea rather than accepting them as they are. Uh, And so the first thing was being was just sort of opening myself up to being willing to see people for who they really were and not try to over romanticize them in my mind into being something that they weren't. So that was just sort of a commitment that I made to myself and then a sort of a constant practice to try to accept people as they are. But more specifically, I made a list of some of the attributes and qualities that I knew I needed in a partner and some of the things that I wasn't going to tolerate. So that way, when I started dating and trying to find that person who was gonna be my life partner, because I was being more open and trying to see people as they were, I was able to sit there and go, okay, this is kind of, this is a value difference that I know is not going to work out. Um, or the reverse, like, oh, great. Here are some things that, that line up. And, and it's important, I think there, if you're going to apply something like this to realize that you're never going to find someone who like fits like some idealistic image, right? Like, and my husband and I have challenges all the time because like one of the things that was important to me was finding someone who had strong values and was willing to stick to their principles because I tend to be very easily influenced by others into doing other things. So I wanted someone who could balance that out. Of course, one of the challenges in our relationship is sometimes he stands strong on principles that affect me in a way that are kind of negative, right? And so I have to, one early in our relationship, I had to be willing to accept that sometimes because there was this attribute that I wanted, I wasn't always going to get the good you know, the good part, I was sometimes going to get the sharp end of the stick. Um, And being willing to recognize that there are going to be positive and negatives to even to the attributes that you want in someone. Right. And we tend to idealize people too. And it can be very difficult to pick up on ideal when you're idealizing someone when you're when you're viewing someone as like, perfect. Um, Especially at the beginning of relationships, we have really intense emotions. So we can easily get swept away into the same patterns and types of people like someone who just sweeps us off of our feet and like, tells us very early on how much they love us and like are interested in us. And it's recognizing those patterns. And when you start dating someone new, if it feels too quick, sometimes if it feels like this feels like what happened in the past, as much as we want to just be loved and just dive right into that, think about what patterns is this person exhibiting that reminds me of this past relationship I had that ended up terribly or just completely didn't work. Why do we put everybody 
on pedestals when we don't even know anybody. Like we're going on, we're going on, and I'm talking more with people who identify with BPD that I've spoken to throughout the years. It's like, we don't know about anybody, but we've gone on one date. Now we're married. Now we know the parents. Now I know, yes. oh my God, he, he loves the color blue. We're perfect for each other. It's like, really? Like, and I'm talking mostly about myself here. It's like Me too. 10 times over. Oh my God, here we go again. What actually helped me was I really just tried to casually date, like get to know people, yeah. go out for mm -hmm. coffee, you know, get to know their favorite band and stuff. Like when my partner and I met, like we spent, I mean, we also met in a context where it wasn't dating from the beginning. It was like building a friendship first. And I think that he, that helped That's so beautiful. much is yeah. like, yeah, I was just like, oh, like what music do you listen to? And like, you know, I was just really genuinely trying to get to know this person at the same time that I was building my own sense of identity, my own sense of being yeah. happy by myself and all that stuff. So I think like, yeah, it, something works different for everybody, right? I think it's so important to build your own sense of identity and because our identities can easily get lost in relationships and when you go into something and you have a stronger sense of your values, the things that you want, like Zandi was describing how she had, you know, come up with things that she really wanted. And I've, I've done a similar thing in my mind, not, not on paper, but it's, it, you have more of, con you have more control. You're less likely to get swept up in that idealized version of that person in your mind and start to see them in a way that um, you would call a more an integrated way. See them for both their good and their bad and say, you know, are, does the bad outweigh the good? Or is this person someone that I would really want to spend a lot of time with? This is such like a fundamental and humongous aspect of BPD recovery that I'm not, you know, I often, I, cause I make a lot of videos like this on TikTok and people will be like, what do I do? And it's like, I, there's no way I'm going to, in a three minute or less video, tell you how you're going to fix this issue. This is something that you work on with a therapist, a sponsor, both, whatever it is, right? This is a huge thing. And there are specific things that I'm sure like we've all been talking about have helped each of us along this journey. And I think um, for me, one of them, yeah, has been, you know, having a therapist who's there to help me check the facts around stuff. And even, you know, now my partner and I are in therapy together, um, you know, because there's just things I want to improve in our communication, you know, mm -hmm. and ways that I want us to be able to relate to each other differently. And sometimes I'm like, yeah. I don't know how to do that myself. Right. Um, yeah. So getting support has been a huge thing for me. Check in with your partner. When you check in with somebody, then they check in with you and as well as creating your own unique systems. So we create our own unique systems that work for us, not always set on books, techniques, strategies, what strategies that work for us. Like we create our own five minute F off systems where it's like, this is not the five minutes at work. We are about to explode, goodbye. So that's one unique individualized system we created for ourselves that we've Very just nice. been doing for the last two months where I know I'm not having it right now for five minutes, Steve, goodbye. And he's like, goodbye. And then we come back five to 10 minutes later and it's like, what were we even upset about? Both of us, <sighs> it's over. For me, the biggest um, help in this area has been going away and working actively on my self-esteem because I've noticed a tendency to self-sacrifice to my detriment and my whole identity becomes the other person because I grew up in a domestic caregiver relationship so really working on and I think we've spoken about this in other episodes but like working on my values and doing you know self-soothing and compassion and doing things that I like to do and just boosting my own self-esteem has meant that I am a little bit more skillful and a little bit stronger when I start a relationship in the early phases of infatuation and a obsession and fantasy when those things can get really strong and really harder to resist um I'm a little stronger I'm a little self-assured so that I know what's me and what's them so that's been my biggest help I would say yeah me too I yeah. think it's been a lot of identity work for me and yeah. figuring out what I want and what I need um from an from a partner and also figuring out what I am willing to not like like there, you know, you can make a list of traits that you want. What's what's okay to not have, and what's not okay. Your non-negotiables. That's what my therapist. My non-negotiables. Yeah, and I think in the past I 
didn't I definitely didn't <laughs> I definitely didn't have non-negotiables. I, I was walked over. I don't all know what mine and... <laughs> are. I still don't know what my non-negotiables are. I was gonna say some of my non-negotiables are things like people who are gonna be emotionally and verbally abusive and physically abusive to you. Because okay, that's... that makes sense. <laughs> A lot of people with BPD end up in abusive relationships because we don't have a low self sense of self-worth and we have like a lack of boundaries and uh, we idealize people. I mean, the way I, yes. I view a lot of my own identity is kind of like integrating my own sense of self. So getting a, a very strong sense of who I am and also being able to see other people for who they are instead of idealizing them. And if it feels too good at the beginning of a relationship and someone's like love bombing me and just like very early on, I'm going to start seeing it as a red flag. Now it's going to be something yeah. I might, you know, say maybe, okay, maybe this person isn't for me, even though it feels so good. It's just, mm -hmm. I, I realize from my history that it's maybe not going to be healthy in the long run. I think, I think beyond the, the non-negotiables, obviously like, red flags and things is another piece because DBT gets so and we're just skills, right? But the thing is, is once you have the skills, we also have to learn how to tolerate our own emotions, right? And in relationships, that's going to be a huge thing, right? Like, because um, a lot of times we do things like wanting to control people or wanting to run away or whatever, because we're experiencing really intense emotions that we feel like we can't handle, right? Like when I went to my first couple of session with my partner and he was sharing what it was like, you know, in moments where I can get really angry in relationship, it was really painful for me to hear. And it was really important for me to hear because I want to be able to show up for his experience, right? And so being able to learn how to tolerate our own emotions is a huge part of being in relationship as well. One important thing is knowing who to talk to. You don't have to share your story with everyone. You don't have to talk to the world, but knowing who to talk to at the right moment and having just a few people that get it or even just listen, it's so important. And we don't yes. understand how important that is, is having that one, two people or even just one person. Funny enough, sometimes I just talk to my dog or a plant, but my turtle, but it, whoever or whatever it is, right? Because it's important. Something that's very important for be being in like a successful relationship is having other people, yeah. like having that person not be the center of your world. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, they can be the center of your world, but they shouldn't be the only person in your world, mm -hmm. which can mm -hmm. happen very easily. A lot of times we like, we like, stop talking to friends we get so in love and we're in the love bubble and yep. it's like oh i haven't talked to friends in months it's not healthy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i've made it a real intention of mine since i moved to another country to be with my partner it's like he is kind of the, the only person i know here yeah. but i've made a real intention to make other friends and it, it's been helping a lot it, you know like just yeah. that person you know they can be our they can be your 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 favorite person but not your favorite person yeah mm -hmm. yes yes thank you everyone so much for watching the second season of the bpd bunch this upcoming saturday we'll have our last brunch episode on bpd and pets so definitely check that out but thank you everyone so much for watching we have had so much fun doing this season and we will absolutely be back for a season three so between now and then we will have a couple of lives on our channel you can follow us on instagram or check out our community feed for some of the updates on those dates <laughs> updates on dates anyway Consider supporting us on our Patreon. We upload episodes a week early and have a bunch of extra behind the scenes and bonuses. So consider supporting us. Link down below. And we will see you next time for season three. Bye. Bye.